Good afternoon and welcome to the Community Development, General Government and, and Housing Committee meeting for February the 9th, 2021. Uh, I'd like to call to order, uh, due to safer at home order, all committee members are participating virtually. For virtual meetings, committee members will be muted until asked to be heard. When there is a vote, it will be necessary to take the roll call vote, a committee member will be recognized, raise their hand and state their vote. Committee members are council member and vice chair Annette Scipio, council member Robert Clark and council member Kevin Monday and the chair of uh, council member Didi, I mean, Denise Adams. Uh, today, uh, I wanna let it be known uh, right now, I only see one other member of the committee and that's council member Monday. Uh, I don't see council member Clark and vice chair Scipio. Uh, what we will do is we will, that we only have one consent uh, agenda item and it's approval of a summary of the minutes and it's the only action required. And what we will do is we will uh, defer that till later on in the meeting once I have a quorum and, but we will go ahead and start with the general agenda. We have five items on our agenda and all five are for information and presentation of such. So um, Mr. Tate, will the city clerk please read the first general agenda item. Item G1, information regarding Think Orange initiatives. Uh, Mr. Taylor. Good afternoon, uh, Mayor Pro Tem and Chair Adams, other members of the committee, as well as other members of the council. And it's my pleasure to, to come before for you today. I'm going to turn this over to Ms. Tiffany Oliva as she uh, presents item G1. Good afternoon, Mayor Pro Tem Adams. Uh, and members Afternoon. of the council. Thank you so much for having us here. I'm Tiffany. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yes, um, I have a new last name, so I got married in October. So thank you. Um, I'm Food Resilience Project Manager with the city, and so I'm really excited for us to hear from Erin Griego, who is a student at Salem College. Uh, and she did some case studies and work with the Think Orange food resource map that we had produced this past summer. You all may rec recall seeing that and just making some recommendations for how we can uh, improve it moving forward. And William Teasley is from uh, a and University and he had the opportunity to also do some case studies and volunteer at the market several times this summer and has made some recommendations for how we can proceed forward this year. So I'm going to go ahead, if we can have the next slide, and pass it over to Erin. Hello, thank you for having me, Mayor Pro Temp and the rest of City Council. Um, so I worked on the Think Orange Food Resource Map, which is available in English and Spanish, and it just shows a wide variety of food resources and all other information that we can have available. Uh, next slide, please. So I started by looking at three different food maps. I looked at Charlotte, North Carolina, Boston, Massachusetts, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Um, all these have, they're pretty similar. But they all have in common that they're usually created in conjunction with some sort of food resource organization and the either state or local government, sometimes both. <laughs> Next slide, please. So the Charlotte map has this really cool radius search function. So what you can do is you can type in an address and control like five miles, for example, and it'll show you all those resources within five miles. So this is really useful for people who maybe can't afford gas, can't afford a car, don't want to spend all that money. Um, they know I can walk this many miles. I can go and find those resources that close to me. Um, the Boston, Massachusetts, they had visible, visible roads on their map, so the major roads were highlighted, and that's really useful because as great as these things are, not everyone has one. <laughs> so without a GPS, you'll be able to say, okay, I know it's in between 4th and 5th. It's on one of these streets, and you can find it a lot easier. 
Uh, the overlaying the bus routes is also, once again, about accessibility. <laughs> Most of these are. <laughs> um, so it's very similar to the others. You just know where the bus routes is, you know your times, you know where you can find the stuff. Uh, Philadelphia actually has their map available in six languages. Oh so we may not need all six languages, <laughs> but looking at expanding language access um, beyond Spanish could be useful. However, that might require language services. Uh, next slide, please. So other recommendations that were not based on other maps. Uh, the load time for the map, if you've ever opened an ArcGIS map, you know those things take forever to load. <laughs> um, and this actually is several instances of the map housed on the same web page, which means every single one of them is loading individually. By moving them to different pages on the Dink Orange site, that allows them to load individually much faster. Um, people don't stay on websites that long, so this could be really useful. Growing our data resources is also really important because currently Tiffany, she has no way of knowing <laughs> how many resources are up to date or who has them or if there's new ones. So by just putting in something as simple as a Google form where she can, a site administrator can say, okay, here's our address, here's our hours, here's what you need. She can vet that and then decide whether or not that should go onto the map. And last, and I think this is by far the most important one, Increasing the internet visibility is huge. So when I was looking for all these maps, it was very difficult to find a lot of them. Um, I had a whole way I wanted to do it and I had to throw that out the window. <laughs> so by rewriting the meta description, what will happen is currently on Google, it's the second, it's on the second search results page. So nobody, nobody really looks at that. Um, it currently has 566 unique views. By changing the meta description and adding in keywords such as location, what exactly the food map is, it would be it would probably bump up to the first page because there's not that many results in general. <laughs> um, by updating the homepage description, very similar to the meta description, it honestly does just about the same thing. <laughs> and then I also tried to search for the Think Orange map on the city webpage, hoping to find the link. If you look up Think Orange exactly, you can find it, but not everybody knows the name Think Orange. And the only other spot that it's available on the city website is through the news section of the Urban Food Policy Council's page. So even just adding its own little section under that page would help immensely in just saying, here's what it is, here's where you can find it. Next slide, please. So in conclusion, <laughs> it is a really awesome resource. It has a ton of other, it has a ton of information and it's really, it's just great. But just a couple hand, handful of things can increase accessibility for those using the map and being able to find resources as well as actually finding the map and being able to use it. Uh, if there are no questions, I can go ahead and pass it on to Will. Uh, I have a question. Uh, what would be, and maybe that's a, another report or uh, information to be gotten to the council, uh, what would it take uh, to make this happen? You know, what would be the, the steps and the, the actions to, to make it happen? I guess also working with staff as to what the costs would be to do this. So for a lot of the ArcGIS stuff, that would have to go to whoever is best at ArcGIS, um, but a lot of the, the internet stuff, the internet side of stuff would be a lot easier. Um, the meta description in my original document that I did, I had actually included a link on how to do that through Squarespace. And same thing with the homepage description, that all would be fairly easy as well as changing the load times, that sort of stuff would be pretty easy. Thank you. Dr. Adams, if I may also add to Aaron's response, um, some of these, like she was saying, are going to be a fairly easy lift um, and not require, you know, additional costs outside of staff time. And Johnny and I have already been in discussions about how we can get going with implementing these. As you all know, this was started kind of as a response to COVID and in hearing stakeholders say, you know, ArcGIS and these mapping opportunities is something that government really has the opportunity to offer. So we're really excited to expand that now that we have 
a little bit more vision um, moving forward within the pandemic. Thank you, Tiffany. Chair Adams, I would like to ask a question if I may. Yes, and I apologize, Councilmember Mundy. I didn't see you. <laughs> that's Go okay. That, that's why I spoke up. Um, this may be a question more for staff or anyone who knows, but do we have a, a, a feel for how many people um, in Winston-Salem have internet access, whether through a portable device or a computer? What's, what's our gap? Because this is wonderful for reaching people who have internet access, but I'm trying to kind of figure in my mind how many people would not be able to use this. Does anyone know? Uh, I see Council Member McIntosh has his hand up. I, I, I don't know that we've ever done that math, but I bet the number of uh, subscriptions could be gotten through um, AT&T and Verizon. I would bet that data is not real, real difficult to, to capture. Um, and also I just wanted to mention that the county has a GIS staff that are very good. I mean, every time I've ever asked them for something, they've done a really good job on it. So some of that capability is definitely not in our house, but right around the corner. Okay, nice Thank job you. on the presentation, Aaron. Thank you. Yes. Council Member Larson. Do we make some attempt to make this information available at public venues, such as libraries, where there is computer access and a printable hard copy would be available if somebody wanted to make it? I mean, how are we, other than the, the website distribution that you're talking about, which is stellar, but I'm curious about following up on Council Members Monday's question about access and what we do that, uh, for example, our recreation centers or other places where people might gather to at least give a, a, an access point at that, at that stage. Is that part of your distribution plan? Council member, uh, or Chair Adams, if I may uh, respond to Council member Larson. Yes. Uh, so predominantly this past year, what we've done is issued press releases posted on social media. Um, but again, that does require, you know, some sort of access to some sort of technology. But what we can do for certain is, is think about how we can make um, some printed information available um, outside of, actually, now that I think about it, on some of our feeding sites, we did include the link. So that did go out in some of the on some um, brochure and pamphlet information, but I think it's a fabulous idea to uh, think about how we can in, uh, offer that information at libraries or recreation and parks. So we'll we'll make sure to look into that. Thank you. Any other questions, comments, Councilmember Monday? I'm sorry, just one more question. Um, I know, I'm assuming that Spanish is the second largest spoken language in the Winston-Salem area. Do we know what the third is? If there was a need for, for adding an additional language, any significant language spoken other than English and Spanish? I would recommend that human relations probably could help us with that mm -hmm. since they do the international events uh, for, for uh, people coming to the city to relocate or settle. Mm -hmm. That would be good to know just for general information, I think. Um, Mayor okay. Tim Adams. What? Yes. Good afternoon. Ms. Sabraha, are you on the call on the meeting? Yes, ma'am, I am. Oh, all right. I, I just wanted to reply um, to Council Member Mundy and that we are waiting to see what the latest um, census statistics show but um, prior to that, um, yes, definitely Spanish was the second most spoken language here in Winston-Salem and Forsyth County, and for a myriad of other languages that were, were pretty um, uh, strong too in the community, um, including languages such as Urdu, um, there were some Asian language, other Asian languages um, from the Hmong community and so forth. So we're not real clear yet what that third language would be. Thank you. You're Any welcome. other comments? There's the other presentation. There's the other presentation. Yeah. Next uh, presenter, Mr. Teasley. Uh, thank you so much. It is an honor to speak in front of uh, the Mayor Pro Tempora Adams and the rest of the City Council. Once again, my name is William Teasley, and I am uh, a student at North Carolina Angie State University. And so this I won't semester... hold that against you, Mr. Teasley. <sighs> Oh man, you can't, you can't. I know. 
<laughs> so uh, this semester, I was actually given the amazing opportunity to work on the Liberty Street uh, Market, which is a new farmer's market that we're actually reinvigorating into the Winston-Salem uh, community to increase the amount of food availability for low-income neighborhoods. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. So uh, for this study, I was actually, both Aaron and I looked at a bunch of different uh, institutions all across the United States to look at the different procedures and systems that they have in place, simply to see if the, uh, why reinvent the wheel. So we could look at what uh, qualities are successful for other institutions and then integrate them into Winston-Salem. And so for this, I was able to look at the Three different markets, the Eastern Market in Washington, D.C., the Napa Farmers Market in Napa, California, in addition to the Greensboro Farmers Market in uh, Greensboro, North Carolina, which I was actually able to visit. And so this is just listing out the really impressive parts of all of the markets that could be implemented into the literacy market that we have in Winston-Salem. So specifically for the Eastern Market, it's really a cultural hub, and they're extremely proud to have that in the Capitol Hill area. Uh, for the, it has an extremely bureaucratic structure that is easy to be expected in Washington, D.C. For the Napa Farmers Market in Napa, California, there's a lot of community engagement with making sure that any of the seniors have their time to get what they need. Uh, children there have something that they can do when their parents are shopping, and they also have incentives to come back socioeconomic issues, such as using Wix and EBT, in addition to having CalFresh, what they call the CalFresh market matching system, which uh, allows them to double the amount of food they're actually able to get with the money that they bring, in addition to having an amazing online presence. So they have different vendor profiles, articles, and videos with different health tips and conversational, op uh, conversational topics, in addition to the Spanish language being available for translation for the entire website. And then specifically for the Greensboro Farmers Market in Greensboro, like I was saying, I was actually able to visit this market. And I've actually been in Greensboro for the last 15, 16 years of my life. And so it was really, really fun to actually come back and then be able to uh, analyze this market simply because I've been looking at it for the last 15 years of my life. But it's extremely tailored towards the clients. It's surrounded by three different colleges a and C, which you're not holding me against, uh, Benny College and the uh, UNCG within an eight mile radius, in addition to having a lot of neighborhoods that are specifically surrounding it that are middle income and not specifically as wealthy as you would expect it to be. And then, like I was saying, being here for the last 15 years, it's definitely a community staple and something that we're extremely proud to have in Greensboro. And in addition to that, all the vendors have uh, very, very, very strict uh, requirements that they have to meet simply to vend at this area. 75% uh, of everything that they sell has to be produced by that vendor so you know everything in there is fresh, it's uh, local, and it's helping a really small business in addition to but uh, actually, against that point, it actually has a 100-mile radius that it has to be produced. So there's a lot of different areas that every all of the products can come from. Uh, next slide, please. So the recommendations I was able to grab from looking at these different markets, from the Eastern market, we need to cultivate uh, relationships with community staples and start to integrate the Liberty Street market into the community of Winston-Salem, not only Winston-Salem, but the Liberty Street in and of itself. Uh, we, need, we should uh, bring artists and musicians to participate so we can increase the real neighborhood feel and uh, kind of use that as advertisement to not only support local artists, however, it can be a draw for an increased uh, population. For the Napa Farmers Market, we need to grow the online and social media presence. So there's constant communication between the market and the people that it's servicing, and it's a really easy place to find all the information that you would possibly need concerning the market. Uh, we need to grow the diversity of the vendors and the products, so there's an increased amount of food availability for the people that we are actually servicing. And then once again, build a relationship with the neighborhood staples. So that includes looking into churches, schools, homeowners associations, really anything that can uh, kind of boost the neighborhood feel of this market. And, uh, and then finally for the farmers third market, uh, the recommendation I was able to pull from that would be to foster relationships with the vendors. So we know exactly what we have to offer them and where they have to offer the market in of itself. Increase the radius requirement. Currently, it is a three-mile uh, radius that the vendors have to produce their uh, their food or their whatever they're vending in as extremely small. So if we increase that uh, that radius, there'd be an increased amount of vendors that are present and then an increased amount of food availability that can be uh, given to the clients. And then finally, establish more convenient time for the offerings. So that is looking into seeing what are the best times that it can be open so the most people can have um, a greater availability to come. Next slide, please. 
And so then finally, so increased advertising efforts. And so that would be fire canvassing at the very beginning of it. So like I was saying, this is something that we're trying again. It um, was tried in the past. And so we're trying to do everything as well as we can this time. So that includes fire canvassing. And so that is going around to advertise specifically around within a walking distance of the market just to tell them that this is something that's here for them as a resource, uh, have their urban food policy council, city council and county commissioner advocates that would be willing to champion this, uh, this market as a solution to food insecurity and food, increased food availability in low income neighborhoods and also having customer experience surveys and data collection, which allows us to understand exactly what the clients need, what they don't need and how we can help them in the future. Because that is really what the market is for. It is for helping these types of communities. Next slide, please. Thank you. <laughs> so uh, the literacy market is absolutely revolutionary in its operation. It was extremely impressive to me simply because when I was looking at the, the case studies that I was doing, there was pointed towards an extremely niche clientele, if, if uh, you're catching what I'm saying. So it's, it was really for the clientele that is not really represented in what the Louisville Street Market is pointing towards. Not saying that the Louisville Street Market is definitely for specifically the BIPOC community. However, it is revolutionary in the fact that it is in a low income neighborhood and it's simply to increase food availability in addition to connecting the small local businesses with a relatively marginalized clientele. Uh, I was absolutely so impressed being able to volunteer there, being able to be in the operation of the entire market. And it's been absolutely amazing to work with Think Orange and uh, Miss Oliva and uh, Johnny Taylor, and in addition to Aaron for this entire project. And so finally, next slide please. I would like to thank you for all thinking orange. And if you do not have any questions, I can pass it back to Ms. Oliva. That was a, a great presentation from both you and Aaron. Um, I am looking forward, uh, Tiffany and Mr. Taylor, to how we build on this information and these great interns. Uh, as they say, we need more. <laughs> uh, and I'd be interested, as you've been doing all of this time, Tiffany, if you can kind of remind everybody uh, how we became to have Think Orange in Winston and how it has now branched out to do other things because that's what we saw in the vision. Uh, that we didn't want it to be where it was a one-time grant, do the grant, program ends, and that's it. Uh, unfortunately, the pandemic came along, which showcased how much the need for everybody to participate uh, in the food disparities and deserts and inequities in our community. Uh, but Tiffany, I'd be interested again for you just to tell the listening or the viewing audience how Think Orange, again, the a little bit of the history of it. Absolutely. So Think Orange started in August of 2018. We received a $115,500 grant um, from the National League of Cities. And um, very thankful to you, Mayor Pro Tem, for bringing that to our attention to apply. And we were one of six cities selected for that grant. Um, and so we went through about a year and a half process. We set, set out objectives predominantly around improving um, participation in federal nutrition programs. But some of it did have to, um, did involve farmer's market and, um, you know, SNAP EBT and things like that. Um, of course, that work has since evolved uh, because my position was created um, and, and that has really allowed us to continue to ensure a strong participation in viral nutrition programs and uh, good meal coordination and coverage geographically um, across meal times with different meal sponsors. It's enabled us to, you know, launch this Think Orange map. Uh, it's enabled us to um, restart the Liberty Street Market and start to think more about how we can, um, you know, embed that into the community and offer these resources. Uh, so so it's, it's, you know, from um, um, urban, urban garden, uh, urban farming and community gardens, um, I find that I get to work on a lot of different topics each day. Um, and, and it's been really wonderful to work with our residents uh, to meet their needs and to think of new and innovative ways that we can do this work. 
Thank you. Uh, Council Member Mundy and Council Member Vice Chair Scipio is, has joined the meeting. Yes, Council Member Mundy. I would just like to make the suggestion that you reach out to our um, local arts organizations in particular. When I was at Sawtooth, we were often looking for opportunities to do outreach with children because if you can teach children to learn to love art, they will come back to you as adults. So this is an excellent venue for, for um, organizations like Sawtooth and then so many of the other organizations that we provide funding to. I think that gives us an audience to go to with that ask to uh, participate there and uh, uh, particularly with the entertaining kids and keeping them on. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Scipio, Vice Chair, would, do you have any comments? And, and Council Member Larson, I will get to you next. No, thank. No, I don't. Thank you. I'm sorry I'm late. I didn't realize the meeting started at four until <laughs> just now. Sorry. It's okay. Council Member Larson. You're on mute. Council Member Larson, you're on mute. <laughs> Am I unmuted now? You're good. <laughs> good. All right. Thank you. Sorry. Terribly sorry. Um, I just thank you. Thank you, Tiffany, for an excellent presentation. This question is really from Mr. Tesley regarding the Liberty Street Market, which I'm ex extremely excited about seeing reactivated. Um, and the question sort of is in your studies, are you including gathering data on management? and fee structures, such things like that, that are actually the nuts and bolts of operating a market. And I don't know whether you've had any contact with the uh, cobblestone market, which is held down here in the South Ward and has been very successful in their management. And it's kind of things you're talking about, entertainment, uh, local food sourcing, uh, those kinds of questions and the model that might be useful to move that up into the, uh, into the Liberty, Liberty Street area as well. But I'm anxious to see us uh, move forward on activating the Liberty Street market. Thank you. Any other comments or questions for the staff and our presenters? Again, thank you so much. And I'm looking forward again as we continue. Uh, great, I see you getting applause. Great presentations from. Um, um, uh, Aaron and Mr. and William. Uh, I hope you guys are going to stick around and work with us some more. We need you. Uh, if you don't hold it them. against me yet. <laughs> huh? What'd you say? I said, if you don't hold it against me yet. <laughs> no, I don't. we're in the MEAC. I went to Morgan State University. So much pride and love for the Aggie. Oh, for um, sure, for sure. I just want you to know how much I appreciate you and the council in the city. Uh, we can't do all this work by ourselves. Again, uh, everyone always hears me say, government can't do all the lift. It's a heavy lift. And when we have young people like you with innovative and energetic, fresh ideas, it, it, it makes me feel so proud to be a citizen of Winston-Salem and to see that you are wanting to help the citizens in our community. So I look forward to whatever new initiatives you bring us and, and working with Tiffany and Mr. Taylor. Thank you so much. Uh, Mr. Taylor, I see you, uh, City Clerk, please call the next item. Item G2, presentation of the Urban Food Policy Council's annual report for 2019-2020. Mr. Taylor. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Ms. Oliva uh, will lead us into this one as well. Wonderful. Thank you, Mr. Taylor. Again, thank you all for another opportunity um, to, to keep expanding on this work of food access. You know, Will's presentation, I'd be remiss if I did not mention that, um, you know, that wasn't possible without the Urban Food Policy Council applying for a grant and, and getting that going, and also to your, to all of your support. Um, so I'm, I'm really thankful for that. Uh, today, we're going to have a uh, Dr. Regan, who's the chair of the Urban Food Policy Council, and also Michael Banner, who is the inaugural chair of the Urban Food Policy Council, present to you on their work from this past year.
Great, thank you very much, Tiffany, and thank you, Mayor Pro Tem Adams, City Council members, um, as well as other members joining the meeting, especially city staff and supporters of the Urban Food Policy Council and, and um, our community members. So here, we're gonna spend about 10 minutes, myself and Mr. Michael Banner, sharing with you our annual report. We're gonna do some broad overviews, open it up for questions, and um, we thank you also have either an electronic or PDF hard copy of our annual report with a bit more detail. So if we could go to slide two, please. As Tiffany introduced me um, as the current chair of the Urban Food Policy Council, Scott Andre Bowen is our vice chair. Mr. Michael Banner um, it was our inaugural chair and also is in the representative seat for Forsyth Food Works. Other members of our council include David Harrison, Tembula Covington, Jacqueline Ramsey, Carol Eckmeyer, and Brandon Williams. We want to take a moment though to thank the mayor, Mayor Joins, Mayor Pro Tem Adams, who's worked significantly with our council, um, as well as origin, you know, was sort of the initiator of our council, all members of city council, Mr. Johnny Taylor, Ken Millett. Tiffany Oliva and other city staff for their support of our committee, especially in some of the activities and accomplishments we're excited to share with you today. Next slide and Mr. Banner, please. Yes, good afternoon, uh, Mayor Pro Temp and, and um, the rest of the council. Thank you for including me in this presentation and sharing all that great information from the Think Orange campaign. I'm very impressed with our in, with your interns. Uh, I love to catch up with them later on. I like their energy and that revolutionary stance. And um, I guess I'll speak briefly towards the duties of the council. You should be able to see it on your slide. Uh, develop strategies to address food access needs in the food desert. Um, two, solicit external support for food-related initiatives. Three, support and encourage programming related to food, nutrition, cooking, gardening, and other topics. Four, devise strategies to increase retail options in food deserts. Five, work collaboratively with food, Forsyth Food Works on strengthening the local food system. Six, serve as a forum for discussing food issues. Seven, make recommendations for enhancing the use operation of food-focused city facilities, including the Carolina Classic Farmer's Market and the Liberty Street Vendor's Market. Eight, educate members of the community about the importance of healthy, fair, and sustainable local food. Nine, explore ways to encourage and promote food-based entrepreneurship. And 10, undertake such duties as may be requested by the mayor and city council. Guess we'll go to the next slide. Yeah, so here, I know the year just zoomed by and we're all hungry for change. Us two on the council, we wanna share a little bit about our activities and accomplishments this year. And here on the, on the slide in a very small font, you can see where it aligns with those 10 duties as assigned to our, our council. But first, we secured a grant from the Food Security Strategies Network through NC State. And this was really about piloting that bi-monthly farmer's market at Liberty Street. Of course, the grant got us started. We could not have done it without the city support, both financially, logistically, staff-wise, et cetera. Um, so this was our most sort of exciting um, accomplishment of the year. We started mid-summer and went through fall. We continue to work with city council on assessing specific parts of the urban agriculture ordinance. We've worked on the vacant lot program. We've worked a lot on residential policies related to chickens, pigeons, and other fowl. We've done that directly um, with the engagement of Mayor Pro Tem Adams' office. We had had some 
um, small pilot projects to work to more address some specific neighborhoods market access through residential permits right before the shutdown. We hope to open back up that opportunity, but that's been on hold right now. We are very excited um, to be planning a food summit. We did co-host a food summit with FoodWorks, but we've got a, an exciting food summit virtually planned for end of March or early April. We have been working very closely with Beta Verde. Some of you all know that as cobblestone, but as well as a number of local agencies, producers, and, and other important stakeholders in our food ecosystem on that food summit. Um, we're really excited about that. Stay tuned for some more information. We partnered with local, regional, and state-based agencies on topics related to food access and COVID-19, whether that was participating in weekly statewide farmers market phone calls, um, as well as other sort of virtual opportunities to collaborate and build community. We also cultivated a partnership directly with Hope Winston-Salem in identifying urban farmers for some of their initiatives um, that they have going on, including their produce prescription program, where they really wanted to try to provide an opportunity for local producers to provide some of those um, inputs for their programs. I'd like to advance to the next slide and turn it back over to my colleague, Mr. Banner. Thank you, Megan. Um, as far as next steps, recommendations, uh, our next step is to host a virtual food summit on topics related to urban farming, community gardening, and or market access. Uh, this was prompted by uh, Mayor Pro Temp, Dee Dee Adams. We are following up on the one we had last time with the um, Forsyth Food Works, which was great but uh, this one should be equally as great. I feel like we're just now starting to get some roots, even though we're kind of you know, caught up in this pandemic, it does feel like we're starting to build some traction. I'm loving the leadership from Megan Regan and I'm loving to uh, support the best way I can. I'm glad you built or, or, or uh, you know, created a space for Tiffany Oliva. She has been like a heaven godsend but um, as far as this, um, this summit we got coming up, we look to help create food access awareness and uh, awareness around community resources and also differentiate policies between Grow Winston-Salem and Urban Farm or the Urban Agricultural Ordinance, which there has been some ambiguity in between those two programs, and we'd like to go ahead and get that specifically, uh, you know, designated so we can better work through those through these programs. Um, we also would like to know what the people's needs are from their mouths, and give them an opportunity to interact with us as the Urban Food Policy Council, and increase more awareness as far as uh, marketing opportunities. So also we are looking to continue to assess the viability of the urban agricultural ordinance and grow Winston programs. Pardon self, I just said that. Um, explore new topics and opportunities in food equity. So it's becoming more and more vast, it's becoming more and more connected. And I think we're gonna be surprised after this summit, once things really start gelling, how much support we really have on a regional basis. So looking forward to this summit. I will pass it on to Megan Regan again for any additional questions. Yeah, so thank you all for your time. Thank you all for your support of our council. We would love to welcome any questions you may have about our annual report or our council in general. Uh, thank you, Megan. Thank you, Michael. Uh, thanks to the food, Urban Food Policy Council and all the people that worked uh, to make it go. Uh, Council Member Clark has joined the meeting as well. I wanted to note that for the record. Um, are there any questions or comments uh, for the Urban Food Policy Council? Council Member Monday. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. Um, question for you folks. 
I know your primary purpose is to provide food where there might not otherwise be a good selection of food. Is there any desire also to increase traffic in general from other wards to help overall sales for those who are exhibiting at the, at the food market or, or, or are we better off uh, letting the primary customer live in those neighborhoods? Does that question make sense? Um, thank you, Council Member Mundy. I think that it makes sense. I would say the first part of your question is best answered by slide three. We have 10 duties as specified by City Council. Um, and so there we've got a, a full plate at sort of addressing many aspects related to urban food policy. Specific to the Liberty Street Market, um, uh, again, I'm open for, for other sort of council members. I'm joined by, by Mr. Banner today. But each market, each business has a specific mission, has a niche. And also when we look at um, the initial design of the geography of the Liberty Street Vendors Market, um, it was very specifically put in the geography of the former thriving Black business district in the specific location in Winston-Salem. It was designed as a vendor's market and lie dormant for a number of years. When we think about the cobblestone market, for example, this is one a lot of people like to kind of look at. It also has a very specific niche mission. If you talk with, um, you know, Margaret from Beta Verde, if you talk with Ariana, the, the market manager there, it has a very specific mission and it fulfills that. That doesn't necessarily have to be the feel, the experience, the guidelines for every single farmer's market. So specifically for the Food Policy Council in the pilot program um, that we pitched for Liberty Street, it was related to food access and conditions related to the pandemic with an existing space. When we look at the geography, census tracked data on the, the neighborhoods near the geography of the Liberty Street Market, these are folks who on average have higher unemployment rates, on average have much weaker food security issues, School shutting down made all of that tension a lot greater. But we also have the other side of the coin, which is vendors, producers, producers in an urban in the urban core, as we might use that term, within a specific geography, producing on small scale farms versus out in Poff Town, et cetera, a larger scale farm, have just very different production realities and access to vending. So again, to me as kind of a, a farmer's market nerd, I know a lot of the policies around, let's say uh, cobblestone, certain farmers are unable to meet the design of that market. Not to say it's good, bad, or indifferent, but for a very small scale farmer or a farmer who's maybe, maybe sort of gigging two, three different jobs, some of those requirements don't fit every single producer. But for us, our vision was really improve access to food for small producers in the region. So, so there we said priority was given to producers within a five mile region because due to COVID, we needed to have it safe for producers and consumers. All of our producers were not within that five mile radius, but priority was given to producers within the five mile radius. And most of our producers were fairly close and weren't at a number of other markets. Um, and so there, it was a specific mission, it was a pilot program, and we're excited to learn from it. But it was really to address these food insecurity, access to fruits and vegetables in a walkable distance for citizens, and also address some of the, the economic realities of, you know, I do love a good plum granny tomato, trust me, I do. <laughs> Thank it's you, price, Reagan. Right, uh, it's price to reflect the certification. Correct. And uh, Council Member Monday, uh, as we all know, the Liberty Street Market has been there for those of us that live in the community, the urban core, for quite a while. And the city has tried to jumpstart its vitality for years since it's been there. Uh, we've tried uh, different models, different techniques, different initiatives, but have not been able to uh, 
get it to do what it's doing now, and that is to attract, uh, as uh, Mr. Teasley and others and, and Mr. Banner, new energy. Uh, the collaboration, you know, as much as we hate the pandemic, the pandemic has to some degree brought different groups and ideas together that were not working together before uh, 2020. So again, we are looking forward to um, everything that the Liberty Market is going to bring forward this, this year. Uh, again, uh, with working in conjunction with the Food Policy Council uh, and all of the other food entities in the city, uh, we've had uh, communication and feedback from a lot of African-American urban farmers and farmers uh, that feel like they have not been able to participate in the agriculture market. That's why we created to change the urban uh, growing policies of the city. We got chickens. Uh, we've got numerous things on the books that we're working on in conjunction that the Food Policy Council basically ushers and brings to us to investigate. Uh, when the Food Policy Council was created, uh, one of the things that I suggested and directed them is their job is to be activists and advocate for food. Uh, their job is to bring us policy that we can change or make better or create uh, that actually has an impact on uh, the quality of people's lives when it comes to food and community. And uh, I just wanna again congratulate the Urban Food Policy Council for doing just that. You guys have done a tremendous job. Are there any other comments or questions? Uh, Council Member Robert Clark. Thank you, ma'am. And I apologize. I thought I was two minutes early and I was 28 minutes late. I did not see the memo on the four o'clock start. Uh, and I apologize. I did not hear the presentation, but I look at this food a little differently and I do want to express th three thoughts. The first one is transportation. At least what I saw when I joined it, I have not seen that word mentioned. I do not think there's a food desert if you have a car. If you can get to Thruway Shopping Center, there are four full-service grocery stores within walking distance, and there's a Walmart that's probably down Stratford, maybe a mile, mile and a half or so. So I do think part of the answer is transportation. Uh, I would guess, and y'all can maybe have the number, how many full-service grocery stores there are in the city of Winston-Salem or Forsyth County. I'm going to guess it's 20 or 30 of them if you've added them all up. Number two, I think there needs to be a recognition that fresh food costs more than canned or frozen. And that needs to be understood in light of the fact that you're pushing fresh foods and therefore you're pushing the more costly end of the food chain. And there's reasons for that and that you have to get in to understand how uh, food is done, produced. Thirdly, I have always wondered or be concerned about the number of farmers that actually live. If y'all had a five mile radius, I, I think you could go out from downtown 10 miles would roughly get Forsyth County. I think it's from Kernersville to downtown, I think it's about eight miles. So 10 miles probably get to county. I do not or no longer go to the one out at the fairgrounds because if you don't get there by 8.30, 9 o'clock, all the food's gone. Uh, and what that says is all the farmers that show up can sell everything they have within an hour or two. Uh, and if you really are wanting to serve the community, I, I question whether or not there are enough local farmers to keep three farmers markets open for more than a few hours. And it's my understanding the reason we have had issues on the Liberty Street was finding enough folks to exhibit there or sell there. And I think that gets back to the concept of um, how many farmers are there. And I, I don't think somebody with a third of an acre is going to grow enough food to feed themselves plus have enough to go. There's a reason farmers are in rural areas, and that's because they need many acres of land in order to grow the food. The last one is a concept you learn in Economics 101, and I'll just mention this, referred to the division of labor. Uh, if you're an accountant, it makes sense for you to be an accountant, and then you take your services and you trade them with someone who's good at uh, maybe a doctor. And uh, in the old days, in the pioneer days, the pioneers out on the frontier would do everything from building their house to growing a little bit of everything and this, that, and the other, but that leads to a very uh, low 
lifestyle. It works when we all do what we do best and then trade or exchange our goods. And I mentioned that in that I am not a, well, if you want to have a, an urban garden, that's fine. My father used to have one, but I can assure you the most expensive tomatoes I ever ate were the ones I tried to grow. Uh, and so I just, I am concerned we're putting our hope on small gardens uh, that people are going to do as hobbies after work. And I don't think that's the answer. I think the answer is transportation and getting the resources. If you want someone to eat fresh food, you got to get them more money because you're asking them to eat the, the most expensive stuff. And if you don't believe me, even go to McDonald's, a salad costs more than a hamburger, and you would think which is just the opposite, but it isn't. Anyway, my thoughts from the conservative side of the room. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you, Council Member Clark. Council Member Vice Chair Scipio. <laughs> uh, I love Council Member Clark. Having great uh, diversity of opinions is wonderful, and our city is filled with them. Um, I do have a couple of concerns also about Liberty Street Market. First of all, I like to know the operating hours because I think it's really important that people know exactly when they can go and uh, when it's open, the days, the hours, and they can show up. Uh, I think that's absolutely um, essential. And as soon as we have those established, uh, I like, I specifically would like to have them, but I think our marketing department needs to really blast it across um, our, all of our, our ways of getting the word out. Um, but in the African-American community, so much of our communications is word of mouth. So somebody has to know exactly when it's open and we spread the word. Um, one of the things that I like to uh, have and I like to request because uh, Councilman Clark did raise that issue is where are our, our full service grocery stores located? And it would be lovely if we would have uh, a map that shows exactly where the full service grocery stores are located. And it also shows where the little neighborhood convenience stores are, which are mostly where the east side of town goes to get any kind of fresh foods because they don't, they don't travel all the way to Stratford Road uh, because we have, I can tell you we have food line and we have Compare Foods now off of Martin Luther King. We have a Compare Foods and a food line off of um, Walltown. And we have a food line at North, Shore, North Side Shopping Center. Uh, and I used to ride the bus religiously when, at one time. And people take that bus and we go all the way up to Walmart to do grocery shopping. So even though people don't have transportation, they do find a way, but it is such a great inconvenience uh, to travel so far to get food. When you look at Publix, uh, Whole Foods, Harris Teeter, um, there are three Har two Harris Teeters up near Stratford Road. Um, and, and you have all of these markets in a concentrated area that people don't have a problem getting to because they do have transportation. But I would like to see that map because sometimes when you see a visual representation of where the gaps are, it really brings home the, the fact that we have to do something about taking care of the gaps uh, because it's about, it's about convenience. And uh, there was also um, the thing I like about the Liberty Street Market is something that I believe still goes on because I'm thinking I just saw this recently. We used to have truck farmers come through East Winston. Those are farmers who would have produce on their trucks and they sell them off the back. And, uh, oh, I, I remember that so vividly uh, because on my street, the farmer bought that good homemade butter uh, that was so absolutely phenomenal. Uh, but the truck farmers, I think, are still working because that takes care of the transportation issue. And somehow our urban food policy, you shouldn't omit linking up with them because they can also get food to those who may not come to the market. But I'm very hopeful that Liberty Street will open up and will be very vibrant 
but we do have to get the word out. We have to get it out because more than the people who live in the area will shop there uh, because more than the people who live near Sandy Ridge uh, Farmer's Market shop there because I go there and I go up to, to the fairground. So, um, but I think, thank you very much, Urban Food Policy, for all of your efforts. Um, and I was very excited. I, I was at your last meeting. I was very excited to know about the chickens. I still think it's, uh, I know we have, uh, you can't have roosters, but that, that was the fun part of having chickens in your backyard, me waking by the rooster in the morning. But <laughs> uh, I think we need to, um, I think you're doing a great job. I think it's something the city needs to promote because the economics of feeding your family is something we have to bring back some of the old ways, which are just home gardens. Uh, that is a beautiful way to food, feed your family if you have the space and if you could do container gardening or whatever. So I would like to see the urban food policy continue your good work, but also think about what you can do to have educational programs for the community in conjunction with like corporate extension uh, or some of our nonprofits. I love meeting all of the nonprofits to do their job because uh, we all have to eat. So I think that's a really good thing to do. Thank you, council member. I'm gonna go ahead and, and let uh, Mr. Banner speak. And then I'm gonna go back to uh, Tiffany just to uh, let the council members in the community know that particularly the council members of the committee that you will be getting the map to them to let them see what you've been doing as well with Think Orange. And Mr. Banner is gonna go ahead and speak. Mr. Banner. Yes, I'm gonna try to keep this brief, thank you. Um, I just wanted to speak on a few of the concerns that um, Councilman uh, Clark had. Uh, I think that, you know, we have to be uh, very aware of the movements and the different growing uh, capacities that's happening all across the country. Um, once the Salem has kind of been is isolated and insulated from that activity, but um, there's a lot of food that can grow with intensive growing methods right here in these so-called small plots. People have made upwards of 50,000 a year on quarter acre plots using these intensive methods. And it's not, you know, a hard, uh, it's not recreating the wheel, it's models already out there. Maybe a few, um, you know, amendments that we might need to get to that point. But you also have to realize that this whole so-called urban farmers movement has kind of been at the point of a sword. It's not like we've had a lot of growing or a lot of uh, breathing room to get out there and, you know, finesse. You know what I'm saying? It's really been like everything is is on real time. So. Uh, we did present or ask of you to consider an organic protocol a couple of years back. You might hear about that again, you know, from, from me and some of my people. Um, I don't know how your conversation is going with it, but it's a lot of it's a lot of flowing green pastures out here that just got a lot of grass out here as well. You know, we walk through these parks, people not using them with the COVID-19. You know, you got a lot of green ways that could be used for silvo pastures with the goats and the sheeps and the bees. I got you, baby. And, you know, we, and the chickens, you know, it's a lot of food that could be produced in greenways, parks, um, abandoned lots, high tunnels, greenhouses, backyards, front yards. You know, don't underestimate that. This city has once been under an agrarian uh, society at one time. So it's not inconceivable for it to go back our organization did was allowed to um, purchase two buses that you will hear of this year moving forward. Like I said, everything's been at the point of a sword. Um, the urban farmers have made an agreement with um, the old children's home for the black orphans out there in Germantown, where they will mm -hmm. be availing upwards of three or four acres to urban farmers to grow more intensively. Um, and we have the buses to get them back and forth um, as far as uh, marketing, yes, there should be more of an emphasis to, you know, get the word out of what's going on. And the reason why we did um, 
you know, circumscribe the the growing uh, the the farmers to five mile radius to the urban to the uh, the Liberty Street Market was basically to close the loop and generate money for the community. You know, we can easily have people pull up from Rural Hall and Germantown and all these other places on trucks and bring food, but that mo that money is going to go back outside the community. So it's a very high um, unemployment rate. And if people are just standing on the block or, you know, doing whatever they do or do it, doing whatever we do, uh, you'll be surprised. This is in our genetics to get out there and work. So when we see opportunities right on the next lot beside us, a lot of people are taking advantage of that and pitching in and seeing how they can help, whether it's growing the food, canning the food, bagging the food, cleaning the food, being accountants, or just making themselves relevant in a, in a, in a organically naturally grown economy from the earth. So I'm gonna keep my words short, but um, really think about, let the organic protocol kind of resonate on your minds, how we can make these, these flowing green pastures, um, you know, sufficient and, and, you know, make them uh, proper and growing out a, a edible uh, foodscape. You know what I mean? And we can reach a lot of more people like that. And think about, you know, how many corner stores have gotten taken away from our community. Because when I grew up, every other corner was a corner store. Now how many corner stores do we have in the city? You know what I'm saying? So think about it's everything is not about a grocery store. You know, think about the farmer's markets, the healthy corner stores, and these uh, organic lots that can also become farmer's market right in the community. Thank you for Thank your time. Thank you, Mr. Banner. Tiffany, one minute talk about the report, kind of condense it because I got three other items. <laughs> Absolutely. I appreciate the passion of the Urban Food Policy Council and to you all council members for your interest in this work. Um, it's, it's Food access, of course, is very important. And um, council member Scipio, we actually have um, done a great deal of work with marketing. We're going to continue to expand that. And to everything that Mr. Banner has said, you know, a lot of this past year has been responding to pandemic needs, and we're starting to look forward to shifting that, um, expanding this work, thinking about how, um, you know, we can we can make even more um, positive things happen and continue to build on this energy. So, um, yeah, I'm really proud of the Urban Food Policy Council and the interns, and we really appreciate the chance that we had today to share with you what we've been able to accomplish. So thank you for your support. Thank you so much. Uh, City Clerk, next item, please. Item G3, information on non-discrimination initiatives. Uh, Ms. Martin. Good afternoon, Chair Adams, members of the committee and council. Um, Winston-Salem has non-discrimination strategies in place for city employment, city issued grants, and city issued contract procedures. Past non-discrimination strategies include the establishment of the Human Relations Commission followed by the Human Relations Department. Both bodies study race relations and forms of discrimination. This information item before you today looks to expand the non-discrimination efforts by broadening the classes of people protected. The first attachment is an amendment to the personnel resolution related to equal employment opportunity. The amendment adds color, religion, and gender identity. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, sorry, gender identity or expression as specifically named classes. The list previously included race, creed, sex, sexual orientation, pregnancy, handicap, age, political affiliation, and national origin. Also attached to this item is a proposed ordinance amendment to include a non-discrimination policy. The policy opposes and prohibits discrimination against the previously stated classes by city administration, committees, commissions, and boards. The policy adds that non-discrimination provisions will be included within the terms of contracts and grants. Further policies will be established to ensure no discrimination is occurring in any function of city government. The city recognizes the benefits of an equitable, diverse, and inclusive community and supports efforts to free our community from discrimination. The city manager and city attorney will investigate the city's authority to adopt and implement procedures 
for the F enforcement of a non-discrimination ordinance upon third parties. City staff will seek guidance for this from the North Carolina Attorney General's Office and the UNC Chapel Hill School of Government. Also attached is a proposed resolution to establish an ad hoc citizen non-discrimination study subcommittee of the Human Relations Committee. This subcommittee will focus on LGBTQIA plus matters within Winston-Salem. The subcommittee will consist of 11 members, two from the Human Relations Commission, and nine recommended by the mayor and approved by city council. The subcommittee will advise the Human Relations Commission as well as city council on critical LGBTQIA plus issues facing this community. Lastly, research will be conducted by staff evaluating city employee health benefit coverage opportunities. As a note, several North Carolina jurisdictions have passed non-discrimination ordinances over the past month or so. Winston-Salem is following a similar measured approach to Raleigh in light of issues regarding authority. Staff is happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Ms. Martin. I don't know what happened. Uh, Council Member Clark, you have your hand up. Yes, ma'am. Uh, it just seems like to me, we sh if we're gonna have a special committee to study this, we should wait till the committee studies it before we make any action steps. Because I have some questions, but I'm assuming the study commission is going to answer those, particularly how it relates to court, recent court rulings. So I, I guess that's the question for me. Okay, I'm going to call on the city attorney, attorney Carmen. Good afternoon, Mayor Pro Tem Adams, committee members, and council members. I'm trying to limit the echo. Can you hear me? I can. Okay. Um, the measured approach, which um, Meredith went over, is is recommended um, first by looking internally at our own city policies and procedures, in particular at our personnel resolution, because it's clear that the city of Winston-Salem as an employer can extend certain protections to its own employees. So we've looked at our personnel policies to include more protected categories. And I think that is something as an employer we should do and, and get started with uh, fairly quickly. Uh, also, in terms of the non-discrimination policy, I think it represents the city's belief that discrimination in all forms should be prohibited. So we're looking beyond just the personnel resolution, beyond our role as an employer to our role as a provider of services as a uh, entity that has various boards and commissions. So again, looking internally to make sure we're not doing things that discriminate against the protected um, classes, which again, I think is something we should be doing even in advance of a committee being established. And, and in addition to that, I think the ordinance just sets forth the desire, the city's desire that employers, third party employers look at their own policies and adopt this non-discrimination approach. It does not go so far as to uh, and put in place an investigative mechanism or an enforcement mechanism against third parties because we're not certain at this point in time, based upon case law and based upon the current statutes, whether or not the council has sufficient authority to adopt and implement such ordinances. And that's certainly something that my staff and I, along with the committee once it's formed, could be looking at more thoroughly. But I think there are some things internally that the city can do in advance of getting the committee in place and that the committee may help um, the city more as it relates to external type of policies and external type of initiatives that it can take in terms of the community at large. So I don't know that it's necessary, in other words, to wait on everything um, to after the committee is put in place. Does that make sense? I'll call you with my specific questions, but yeah, um, okay. I get what you're saying. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Clark. Thank you, Attorney Carmen. Uh, Councilmember Larson. 
Yes. Uh, do you have a timetable for the uh, preparing these resolutions or ordinance changes and uh, forming the committee? What kind of schedule are we looking at, Meredith, on that? Can you repeat that? I couldn't hear the question. I apologize. You, you did not hear me. I'm interested in the timetable. I mean, you laid out some very specific actions to be taken regarding uh, ordinance changes and forming committees and what have you. Can you give me some ideas to what the schedule of that might be? Yes, sir. We, um, Councilmember Larson, we plan, this is an information item today. We plan to bring that back for action next month. Um, <laughs> and and for, for you all to vote on. So the, the action would be specifically on the uh, resolution of, of uh, non-discrimination, the changing to the ordinance? It would be on, on all three attachments. So the personnel resolution adding um, the three additional classes, the um, non-discrimination policy ordinance, and then the resolution creating the subcommittee of the Human Relations Commission. Right, okay. If, if yeah. Attorney Carmen. If I may just add to that, um, the timetable is, is a little bit more flexible uh, in that, uh, of course, it's an information item now, and depending upon the desire of the committee, it may take an additional month or two or, or perhaps three to move this item uh, further along. But once the item is adopted, there is a 100-day built-in period for the city manager and I to come back to the committee and council with some more information uh, regarding enforcement procedures and so forth. And hopefully by that time, I will have obtained some more definitive answers from the School of Government and the Attorney General's office. Thank you. Council Member Monday. Thank you, Chair Adams. Um, in response to, to uh, Council Member Clark's question, there is no, um, there's no doubt that we need protection for the LGBTQ plus community. I'm a member of that community and we really are just about the only minority that is not protected by law. Um, we're the only minority that gets kicked out of our homes for being what we are. We're the only minority who gets kicked out of our churches for what we are. So having your city step up to protect you goes a long way and, and uh, celebrating and, and, and confirming, you know, our individual um, beings who, uh, to allow us to be who we are. Uh, the, the suicide rate is highest among any other group among um, uh, gay and lesbian teens. So there's some real human rights issues at, at stake here. Um, the purpose of the committee, I think, is much like the human rights commission that we have now is what else do you need to do? This is just a, a start. This is to get on paper that we're protected by law. But moreover, when you look at this through uh, uh, your economic lenses, um, if we don't do this and we don't do this now, people will look where they want to go to work and they will just scratch Winston-Salem off the list. This, it's, it is, it's an economic um, death knell if we don't do this. Um, if you search right now, if you look, if you happen to be gay and you're looking to come to Winston-Salem and you search gay in Winston-Salem, what you find out is that businesses in Winston-Salem discriminate against gay people. I, I challenge you to Google, and I think that's the third story that you'll find. We need to change that narrative that says if you're looking to relocate your company here, if you're looking to relocate as an employee, that the first thing that pops up when you do a Google search on Winston-Salem and gay is that we're gay-friendly and supportive. Um, that's the workforce of tomorrow, not my age, not your age, but um, anybody in their 20s or 30s, nobody wants to live in a, a city that discriminates. So that's my emotional and my economic appeal. Council member, Vice Chair Scipio. Uh, yes, I just had a couple of, uh, I, I believe I'm right in, in making some assumptions and I just wanna make sure my assumptions are correct, um, and if not, uh, to ask the questions. Uh, in my, uh, this is mainly about the non-discrimination study subcommittee. Um, is it the role of the current Human Relations Commission 
to address non-discrimination activities on all of the other protected classes or not? Attorney Carmen. The uh, Human Relations Commission addresses discrimination um, on various protected categories, um, one of which includes sex. And by case law, that has been an interpretation that sex includes uh, sexual orientation, gender identity, gender expression. I think that the goal, however, of this subcommittee of the Human Relations Commission is to allow the subcommittee to focus more narrowly on the discrimination and other um, quality of life issues that impact the LGBT. QIA plus community. So I think the committee itself is more focused on that population. So my, my actual question is, who addresses the issues of discrimination on race? It would be the Human Relations city. Commission. And, Human Relations and all Department the other Commission. issues. So that, right. okay. Yeah, I know we still have issues of discrimination based on race. And I don't think they are really focused on that way. So part of me says that if you're going to have one on any, where we have continuing, known continuing discrimination issues, and we are sensitive to them, then we certainly need to have a group focus on those issues. I'm not opposed to this subcommittee. I'm just thinking about the other classes that we know there's no one focusing on the discrimination that's going on in that area. So that's just my concern on that, um, that I think or we take the Human Relations Commission and make sure we have subgroups that are focusing on these other protected classes so no one is left out or blindsided of, about these relationships that we have a hard time dealing with in our society. Um, I, I certainly think that these addition to the resolution to the articles of the personnel resolution are, are spot on. I think that they certainly should be um, considered and moved forward. Um, whenever we have any group of people who are experiencing discrimination across the board, we should never tolerate it in any form. And we need to be proactive to eliminate it because all discrimination is bad. There nobody benefits from that. So I certainly am in favor of uh, amending our our personnel policies and moving forward with other policies within uh, the city. But I certainly don't want us to uh, operate as if all, all of the ills are, 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 have already been satisfied for females and for African-Americans and people of color at the, um, because they have not. Uh, we still have to deal with that and I don't want us to take a side step and not deal with those in addition to the ones that we're trying to address now. Thank you, Ms. Chairman. Ms. Chairman. Thank you, Vice Chair Scipio. Uh, Ms. Abraha, are you on the call on the meeting still? Yes, ma'am, I am. Would you like to comment about the Human Relations Commission in short order? Sure, um, Mayor Pro Tem, thank you. And I would like to specifically um, respond to some of the things that Councilmember Scipio mentioned. And that, yes, the Human Relations Commission does indeed investigate claims of discrimination based on race and gender, national origin, religion, familial status, disability, and so forth. There are seven protected classes. And so what we have done, even though our specific authority from HUD is to investigate claims that uh, violate housing discrimination law, we have over the years expanded that reach in terms of outreach. And we've made sure that any kind of outreach that we've done in the community has included outreach to those specific seven protected classes. 
And so, of course, the LGBTQIA plus community has been included in that. Um, we, however, have not focused exclusively on one particular class. Like we haven't just looked at race only or looked at sex only or just looked at religion only. We've tried to make sure that we have been pretty inclusive and expansive in terms of reaching out to the community to make sure people are educated about their rights and protections. And so definitely um, that is something that falls very well within the purview of the Human Relations Commission. Um, also, we have a couple of commissioners who were on the call um, who had thoughts of their own, I'm sure. And I don't want to speak for them. And Mayor Pro Tem, I don't know if you would um, allow them maybe a few seconds to say something um, that may pertain to anything that I've touched on that I might have missed. But I just wanted to just respond specifically to Council Member Scipio and that yes, that is the scope and the um, line of authority for the Human Relations Commission. Uh, thank you, Dr. Abraha. I'd, I'd love to hear from them, but I still have two more items and a consent item to vote on. And this item, all of them are for discussion. So that means all of them, particularly this one, will be coming back. You right. know, it, it'll be, they'll be bringing it back. Uh, Ms. Martin, Attorney Carmen, City Manager, you, others, uh, it'll be coming back. Councilmember McIntosh. You're on I'm mute. Sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry, I was, uh, I was looking at my agenda for, for my meeting. What was the question? You were said that you wanted to speak on this item. That was a previous item. Okay. I'm good. Thank you. Sorry. Uh, Council Member Monday. You're on mute. Just the, my last comment is because um, I was one who wanted this committee. Um, the committee is not uh, designed to investigate any charges of uh, discrimination. It is really more a quality of life, a what, how can, how can the LGBTQ plus co community have a voice at the table, a presence. Um, it's not about investigating at all. I think we would definitely want to leave that to the experts. And I agree with you, Council Member Scipio, we're nowhere close to uh, closing the gap with discrimination with these other protected classes either. Um, but this would put my community on equal footing. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, one of the things that uh, <clears throat> uh, I would can say that Attorney Carmen and myself and Councilmember Monday have met with a lot of groups, uh, interested parties, uh, that this uh, affects their life every day. Uh, but I want everyone to know, just like Ms. Martin mentioned, that we do know that other cities, and we have, all the council has gotten hundreds of emails, phone calls, text messages, um, and I applaud you for that engagement. But just as other cities in North Carolina uh, have moved forward with crafting their ordinance or resolutions, uh, it has been made very clear, and I know it's hard for people to, to say or hear the city say that we have to study the issue. And it's not that we're against anything, we just have to study it and we have to take a measured approach. And some of our counterparts have done this and you know, they didn't put any teeth in it. Uh, you have to look, as the attorney said, at the enforcement side of this. What good is it to create an ordinance or a resolution and there's no way you can enforce it? There's no way you can hold people accountable. So we're, take, we're gonna take the measured approach. And I know that uh, I've had uh, questions or comments about, uh, well, when is it going to happen? What's your timeline? I said that the process timeline is it gets on a committee agenda. It then moves back the staff and others to create the language and continue to do the follow-up resource with the attorney general and the school of government and the National League of City, uh, the North Carolina League of Municipalities, as well as our other counterpart cities who are doing this. Then it comes back to committee for probably more discussion. Uh, as Councilmember Clark said, he has questions for the attorney. 
Uh, again, uh, I just want you to know that the city takes a measured approach, methodical uh, viewpoint on practically everything that we do. We don't rush. We take our time. People can talk about us all they want, and we're slow. But that, that does not mean that we are not actively trying to make sure that whatever actions we do, that they are actions that you will be satisfied with, as well as the city and others that are affected by this. So with that, are there any more questions or concerns? I got two more items and a general agenda item. Okay, thank you. City Clerk, next item, please. Item G4, Disadvantaged Business Enterprise Program Update. Mr. DeCane. Good evening, Madam Chair, members of the committee, members of the City Council. This evening, I'm, uh, I'm gonna kick this over to our Director of Transportation, Ms. Tanique McCullough and Ms. Marlene Davis to give you an update on our Disadvantaged Business Enterprise Program. Um, as, as a quick reminder, this is uh, tailored towards federal funds that the city receives. And um, with that, that's the extent of my knowledge. So I'm gonna pass it off to the experts. Tanique? Thank you, Ms. McCullough. Uh, good evening, Mayor Pro Tem Adams and members of the committee and city council. I'm Tanique McCullough, Director of Transportation, and today I'll be providing the update on the city's disadvantaged business program, which was adopted by city council on July 6, 2020. Um, and then at the end of the presentation, Marlene Davis uh, and I are both available to answer any questions. And I'll try to go through rather quickly. Next slide please. Um, so I will cover the following topics, what the DBE program is, why the city must have a program, the city's current goals and how they were developed, and then any next steps are where we are now. Next slide, please. Uh, the Disadvantaged Business Enterprise Program is a U.S. Department of Transportation's program to allow small businesses owned and controlled by socially and economically disadvantaged businesses to compete fairly for federally funded contracts. Next slide. <clears throat> DLT uh, presumes that certain groups are disadvantaged and those groups include women, Black Americans, Hispanic Americans, Native Americans, Asian Pacific Americans, subcontinent Asian Pacific Americans, are other minorities found to be disadvantaged by the U.S. Small Business Administration. Persons who are not members of one of these groups who own and control their business may also qualify based upon their business size and the personal network, but they must demonstrate their company's independence and the certification is not done by city staff, but done by NCDOT staff. Next slide, please. The Federal Highway Administration, the Federal Aviation Administration, and the Federal Transit Administration are the three main DOT administrations involved in the Disadvantaged Business Program. The city receives funding from uh, two of these agencies, the uh, Federal Transit Administration and the Federal Highway Administration. Next slide, please. <laughs> FTA is um, responsible, or the Federal Transit Administration, is responsible for oversight of our federally funded transit programs. Funding can be withheld if we are not in compliance with their DBE program requirements. NCDOT, on the other hand, has oversight of our Federal Highway Administration funded programs. Next slide, please. So the city must have a DBE program because we receive funding from the Federal Transit Administration and we award over $250,000 in Federal Transit Administration funds to prime contractors. That same limit applies to the Federal Highway Administration. Next slide, please. In previous years, the DBE program for the Federal Transit Administration funds were administered by WISTA. However, during our most recent triennial review, which is a, three, a review that uh, FTA performs every three years, um, FTA determined that the program must be administered by the city since the city and not WISTA is the designated recipient of federal funds. Next slide, please. 
So in compliance, the city adopted a DBE program and a Title VI program on July 6, 2020. A DBE liaison officer and Title VI coordinator was also identified. The importance of this is that the DBA liaison officer in particular must maintain direct and independent access to the city manager on DBE program related matters. That means that if there's a situation that we're not in compliance with rather than having to work with or report to someone else on the staff, they can go directly to the city manager to resolve the issue. Next slide, please. So the DBE goals um, of 6.9% were established based upon the current list of companies certified as disadvantaged business uh, DBEs who are available to perform the work identified to be contracted out over a three-year period. This is for the fiscal year 2020 through 2022. In the federal fiscal year 2020, we met the goals, but we reported awarding funds to only two DBE agencies. And the importance of that is that the goals are set um, because they have to be verifiable goals, which means that when goals are established, we need to make sure that there are companies that are registered as DBEs who can perform the particular type of work on the contract. And if there aren't any companies, then of course the goals will be low. And if there are more companies, then the goals can be higher. Next slide, please. Projects util utilizing Federal Highway Administration funding follow a similar process. However, the goals are not set by the city, but they're actually set by NCDLT uh, since they administer all of the Federal Highway Administration funds awarded. Next slide, please. Um, this was an old slide from the uh, last month's presentation, but um, we did invite companies um, or stakeholders to review the goals and the methodology used and to learn more about the DBE program. That meeting was held on uh, Thursday, February 4th. Um, for that meeting, we did have over 100 um, individuals to register with 55 that uh, did show up uh, for attendance uh, for the virtual meeting. Um, and the importance of that was really to allow the stakeholders to review the goals and the methodology used to set the goals, but also to uh, ask questions and learn more about the DBE program and why it is important for companies who may not be registered as a disadvantaged business to register if they are actually uh, able to certify. Next slide, please. Uh, you can go to the next one. Uh, that's all that I have. Um, Marlene and I are available to answer your questions. And this last slide actually has contact information for Marlene Davis in case anyone wants to reach out to her in, uh, independently. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, I see Rob, Councilmember Clark's hand is up. And I'm gonna probably also ask uh, Councilmember McIntosh if he has any comments since he is chair of Public Works. Councilmember Clark, uh, just real quickly, if you could send additional information on that 6.9 percent, I'm assuming that's on road projects or transportation projects. But if you could give a little more information there, and what vendors we were able to use. Yes, sir. We can provide that information. It'll be fine. Our two years, whatever's convenient. Thank, Thank you, ma'am. Councilmember McIntosh. Yeah, then I was going to ask for the same thing. So it would be interesting to have that and uh, be able to uh, dig, dig, dive in a little deeper there. Absolutely. Thank you. Ms. Davis, do you have a comment? I have no comment, but thank y'all um, today for just allowing us, well, to, lead, to do the presentation. And I'm just excited to uh, fulfill this role. Thank you. Uh, I think I may be wrong, Ms. Councilmember McIntosh. Uh, didn't, didn't, and maybe Ms. Tanique uh, McCullough, didn't this come through uh, the transportation advisory? Did we see this there as well? That's what I thought. Yes. Yes. Very good. Yes. Thank you. Um, City Clerk, next item, please. Item G5, in information on Winston-Salem sign ordinance provisions related to anonymization and electronic messages. Mr. Decay. Thank you. 
Uh, good evening again, Madam Chair. I'm sorry, I, I was just going to kick it to, to Mr. King, but uh, um, our planning well, and development. You can, you can kick it to Mr. King if you like. <laughs> yes, ma'am, consider it done. Aaron, the floor is yours. <laughs> I, really, I really see Mr. DeCain make this presentation. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, good, good evening, um, uh, Mayor Pro Tem, Adams, and Council members. Um, I will tee this up, and then Mr. Corley on our staff is going to make the presentation. Um, way back in 2007, the city council adopted a sign ordinance, and one of the key provisions of that ordinance was an amortization period, and that period was 15 years. And as you can do the math, you can quickly see we're running up on the deadline for that, which is July 2022. Um, basically, what that period said is if you've got a sign at your, at your establishment and it doesn't comply with the standards, you've got 15 years that sign can exist, but come July 2022, you got to be right with the sign ordinance. Um, we're going to get some information on that, especially in light of the unique circumstances brought upon by COVID-19. The second piece of this item also lies within the sign ordinance as well. It contains standards for electronic message board signs. And to be clear, those are not billboards like you see on the side of the highway. Those are not signs attached to buildings. What we're specifically referencing are freestanding signs that sit outside of a business. So think of Walgreens that might have a message when you drive by at lunch and it says bread, $3, and you drive by in the evening and it says milk, $4, or whatever it is. That's the specific signs that Mr. Corley is going to be talking to you about. So uh, I just want to give a brief intro. Um, we've prepared this information and we'll, we'll certainly await direction from the committee and we're here to answer any questions. But with that, I'll turn it over to Mr. Corley. Mr. Corley. Yeah. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem and members of the committee and members of the council. Um, Aaron did a great job introducing this item. I'm just going to speak really briefly about these two specific things, amortization and electronic message provisions of the sign ordinance, and then I'm going to outline some options for the council if they decide to give us direction um, to change some of those provisions. So next slide, please. As was mentioned before, the sign ordinance was adopted in 2007. In, I'm sorry, in 2007, after a lengthy outreach and drafting process, it was the result of some recommendations in Legacy, which is the city and the county's comprehensive plan. Um, discussions among business leaders, community members, the planning board, and the city council. Um, the ordinance regulates the type, number, dimensions, construction, maintenance, placement of all the signs in the city's jurisdiction, all of those provisions are enforced, <clears throat> excuse me, in our department by the inspections division. Next slide, please. Um, Aaron kind of explained this a little bit, but amortization refers to the period of time during which an existing sign that did not meet the 2007 standards must be brought into compliance. Um, Non-compliant signs could remain in place up to 15 years unless they were structurally altered, at which point they would have to comply with the rules that were established in 2007. Uh, because the installation and maintenance of signs can be expensive, these provisions gave owners more time to comply with the regulations that were adopted in 2007. And that amortization date, as was mentioned before, is July 1st, 2022, currently. Um, this chart that you see on the page is the result of a uh, survey that our staff conducted in 2017. The intent was to do this survey in 2017, notify property owners who were non-compliant that they had until July 1st, 2022 to become compliant. We were going to repeat this process in 2020 uh, before COVID. And then we were also gonna notify property owners one year out, so this year in July, um, prior to the amortization date. The chart that you see at the bottom of the slide is a compilation. It's an approximation really of what we gathered in 2017. So you can see that we looked at about 2,842 signs across the city. Um, almost or a little more than 2,100 of those were compliant when we did this survey and 733 of them were not compliant. It's only 26% of all the signs, um, and these are estimates, of course, there's room for error, but 26% of the signs were not compliant at that time. Um, that table also breaks down, you know, by ward, how many signs were compliant and non-compliant. Obviously, the South and Southwest wards have our big commercial areas in the city, so they have a lot of signs to begin with. Uh, next slide, please. Next provision 
is the electronic messages provision. Uh, the current provisions allow one complete change every two hours. And what I mean by a complete change is there's no scrolling, no flashing, no rolling, um, nothing, nothing like that. It has to be a complete, uh, a whole and complete change and you can only do it once every two hours. That's the current rule. Um, a common complaint that we receive from property owners, sign contractors, others, is that the, this period is too long. Once every two hours is, is uh, too strict, is what we're hearing a lot of. And I imagine that some of you are hearing that as well. Um, in addition to that, enforcement requires devoting a significant amount of staff time to monitoring one single location. We have to be there to make sure that the sign changes more than once in every two hours. So that means we have to be there at least two hours. Um, council, as I mentioned before, probably is receiving complaints that, the, that this particular provision is too strict. Some additional concerns we hear from the community are that some of these signs are too bright. Um, they can be distracting and disorienting, especially if you're rounding a corner um, or, or cresting a hill a really bright sign can disorient you and potentially cause a traffic accident. So those are some co some concerns that we hear from community members related to electronic messages. Next slide, please. So the, the options that the council has at this point, based on this information and, and what you're hearing from the community, you can make no changes to the sign ordinance. That's perfectly fine. Um, you could direct us to investigate extending the amortization date past June 30th, which is the last day the signs are technically allowed to exist non-compliant. Um, you could adopt provisions that allow more flexibility or less flexibility for electronic messages as it pertains to the change rate. Uh, there could also be some standards added for the brightness of electronic messages. So those are the, those are the options related to these particular issues. Um, that we think the council has. And I would be happy to answer any questions. Council Member Vice Chair Scipio. Thank you. Mr. Uh, Corley, I have a, uh, just a question for you. Um, do we know how many signs were not compliant in 2007? We do not have that information. I don't believe we conducted a survey at that time just to determine how many signs were not compliant. So we don't know whether people have actually changed it or this number of 733 is the same number that was in 2007. We just don't know if people just decided we're they're not going to obey our ordinance or not. There isn't a way to know 100% for sure, but I think we can assume that some of these signs or some of the signs that are out there now were signs that were non-compliant that became compliant. Um, you know, occasionally NCDOT will acquire some right of way that requires people to move their sign. Whenever they move that sign, that sign has to become compliant with the current ordinances. Other situations may arise, a property may change ownership, somebody may want to change the business, they have their standard you know, sign package that they want to have, the current sign doesn't, doesn't fit the bill, so they change the sign and they have to comply. Um, we, we started to look at calculating or, or trying to estimate you know the number of signs that may have changed just between 2017 and today um, but going back to 2007 we probably don't have any really good information okay um, and just so that I'm making the right assumption any signs that uh, were erected after 2007 are in compliant with our ordinance they should be, yes, if they got okay. the appropriate permits. Okay. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Council Member Clark. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Just a couple of quick comments and uh, follow up. First off, to Ms. Scipio's comment, I actually was on the, I guess, the ad hoc committee that looked at this. And I will say, if you start to notice signs, you, you will see the new ones are much, much smaller. Um, in retail, we thought 15 years would be adequate because I can think where I buy gas and I think it's on its third different name since uh, 15 years ago. 
but you will certainly notice that. Now, my questions, comments, if we could get a list, I know the one exception, exception are historic signs. How big a deal has that been? Maybe how many there are, if it's a small enough list, you can give me the list, but, but how many there are. I did get a request from one of my uh, constituents on a historic, quote, historic sign in, on his property. Number two, I think it would be nice if, if somehow we could get an update on 2017. Um, I was surprised we were as high as 84% or whatever we are, 86%. Uh, but it would be nice to know. And of course, since 2017, we've had more buildings go up. So the denominator has changed as well. So it may be closer to 90 cent percent by now. But if somebody could comment on how difficult that would be. As, uh, as far as brightness, I've never really noticed that, but if, if we could maybe do a little research, if that's something that uh, science can be changed, how easy or difficult it is, and is there an industry standard or whatever. Um, my comment on the two hours, I thought it was terribly lengthy then, uh, and I would certainly be supportive. I think three to five minutes would be <clears throat> very adequate. What we didn't want were flashing signs when you're going down the street and, and things distracting drivers. But if you're driving down the road in, in uh, two minutes, you're going to drive by any sign that you see, unless it's a, a awful lot of traffic there. And lastly, I do think this is worth looking at. This is hitting at probably the worst time it could for retail, which is really taking it on the chin. Not only, uh, of course, the restaurants have hardly been able to be in business. And the other one is a lot of retails being beaten up by internet sales. And that's not a pandemic. That's more of a long-term issue, but uh, I would just throw out a two to three year extension, I think would be more than enough to get us out of the recession. Uh, and that coupled with an update on exactly where we are would give us an, an order of magnitude. Are we talking about 10% of the signs or we still talk about 24%? Anyway, thank you. Talk quick so we get going. Thank you. Thank you. I, can give you a little, I can give you a little bit of information on that if, if you'd like. Um, as far as the historic signs, I think there have been two campus gas in the North Ward on, um, by Wake Forest University has received approval, and Mr. Barbecue on Peters Creek Parkway has received okay. approval. Those are the only two signs that have gotten a historic exception to my knowledge at this point. We can look back through our permit records, probably Desmond from 2017 up to now, to see how many alteration permits we've issued to give you a difference of who's come in compliance since 2017, and we can try and get you a ballpark on that. And Councilmember Clark on the brightness issue, two of the times that has come up, um, I can think of, I think I've been in your ward on South Peace Haven Road, there was a church that installed just south of 421 that installed a sign out there, um, and we got concerns from um, neighbors out there that it was too bright. Another church along North Peace Haven Road, close to Robin Hood Road, installed a sign. And after it was installed, we got complaints there. And then the car wash on Peters Creek Parkway, um, close to the Bojangles, that's another one where we received complaints about the brightness associated with that. Brightness was, frankly, something that wasn't on our radar in 20, yeah. 2007. It's yeah. come up subsequent to this. Had we known that back then, we might have included it. But we can certainly do some benchmarking and see if folks have some standards. And we can bring that back to, um, back to the committee. Could you also benchmark the time change if that's yes. why you're marking? Yes. Thank you. Council Member Monday. Uh, Council Member Clark covered almost all the issues I had, and I agree with, with everything he said. Um, particularly on the brightness, I wouldn't make changes just based on anecdotal, but if there were some quantitative data that supported it could cause car accidents or, or rear enders or what have you, then it would definitely be worth pursuing. But if you ask someone to complain, they generally do. So um, I would take that with a grain of salt. Okay. Council Member Larson. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. Um, when the letters went out, what, two years ago, reminding people about the violation, I got several calls on it. And part of the problem was, is the letter really didn't address specifically what the violation of that sign was. It said they were in violation, but it didn't say whether it's a matter of size, height, lighting, what, what the problem was. As we go through and look at trying to uh, re-identify the number of signs are in violation, if we're going to do that, which I think is a useful exercise, um, I think we need to, if, as, we, as we notify the various merchants, 
exactly what the problem with their sign is. And I, either that or have them call you or do something with it. But the information of what the violation was is a little unclear. I would share with uh, Council Member Clark's concern about merchants. Uh, right now is not the time to be putting an additional burden on them. And I would I would certainly support a, an extension of the moratorium. And I would certainly uh, encourage some consideration of what constitutes a historic sign, maybe in consultation with the Historic Resources Commission. Over the past 15 years, our attitude towards signage and historic elements have, have changed a lot. So if we could maybe revisit that issue, particularly with the experts who know something about history, I would appreciate it. Thank you. Councilmember McIntosh. Yeah, I mean, everybody's taking my talking points, but I guess I just wanted to say that, um, you know, a lot of effort and a lot of community input and a lot of gnashing of teeth went into this when this was drawn up. Um, I don't think we're talking about looking at a wholesale change to that. Um, I, I certainly would not be in favor of that, but I do think it's a time that, um, you know, two, three year extension on our part um, has, a, has a very, very low cost to the city and could be extremely helpful to uh, our local merchants. Okay. Mr. King, Mr. Corley, uh, you have your marching orders. Thank you so much. If there are no more uh, comments or questions, city clerk, may we have the general, the consent item, please. Community Development Housing General Government Committee Summary of Minutes. Um, may I get a motion to move, move approve. to approve? Second. <laughs> it, it's been um, moved by Councilmember Vice Chair Scipio and seconded by Councilmember Clark. Uh, roll call vote, please. Vice Chair Scipio? Yes. Councilmember Clark? Yes, ma'am. Councilmember Monday? Aye. And the chair votes yes. And the motion passes and is approved. If all minds and hearts are clear, uh, thank you all today. I know it was long, but we got through it. Uh, have a great day and stay safe and get your shot. These are <laughs>